morning, everybody. It is Monday, April 8th. Microphones are on. It's about 7 o'clock. And uh, we'll call the meeting to order with the Pledge of Allegiance. Present. 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 Okay, good evening. Uh, we are launching into the consent agenda. We're going to mix things up a little bit. We'll see how it goes. Nothing too dramatic, but the consent agenda, if, for those of you that watch the, uh, the agenda, has been reformatted slightly. And again, any items that are pulled off of the consent agenda, we will reach, but we'll reach them later on in the meeting instead of, instead of right away so we can get to uh, our public hearings. Also, tonight there is no executive session, so there will be an open forum. So we'll do that right uh, after we have one uh, pre-signed presentation, and then we'll have a general open public forum. So on the consent agenda item tonight, we have approval of uh, town council minutes from March 15th, 2019. That's regular and executive. The April 1st executive session minutes. Part B is to acknowledge receipt of boards, um, minutes from boards, commissions, and committees. Four sets from the Budget Committee, the Open Space and Land Preservation Commission, two from the Personnel Board, Recycling and Landfill, three from the Planning Board, and one from the Tiverton Prevention Coalition. We also acknowledge receipt of reports from the Administrative Officer for the Planning Board for February and March, from our Town Administrator for the March Department Monthly Report, and also from our Administrator for the Fire and Police Overtime for March. And finally, we acknowledge a receipt of correspondence from the Town of Gloucester, a resolution regarding the stabilization of state educational aid, and the Town of Smithfield's school department. They have five resolutions, one on financial literacy, one on gun-free schools, gun schools, one to an Article 12 resolution to amend Article 12, uh, another one on contract continuation, and one on binding arbitration. Again, all five of those are from the Town of Smithfield department are there any items to be removed for further uh, consideration uh, mr. president I'd like to um, remove b5 and sort of along with c1 any others and also do we get the minutes from the town council meeting yeah. no, no she couldn't mm -hmm. them. I couldn't get them. that's what I thought okay okay okay, okay. So we want to take those off as well then okay all right very well Okay, so we're looking for a motion to approve um, the one, two, three, four, six, item C23 and all of part D. So moved. May I have a second? Um, I we also need to remove C2, the town administrator. Oh, okay. Okay, I'll give them that. Okay, are you willing to restate that motion? Yeah, as um, such? I will move to approve Consent agenda B, less number five, C three, and all of D. Okay, and with that motion, we'll take a second. I'll second it. All right, all those in favor? Thank you. So those removed items will be taken up down on regular business. Next, we move into the public presentations. First, we have a presentation from Ms. Sally Black and Kelly Levesque from the Pivot and Prevention Coalition. And uh, we'll hear what we have to say. Good evening, I'm Kelly Levesque, this is Sally Black. Uh, we're members of the Tiverton Prevention Coalition and we just have some updates for you for tonight. Uh, this coming May marks one year of our grandparent support group uh, for Newport County, which is open to any uh, grandparent raising a grandchild, uh, no matter where you live. Um, they'll be presenting on Cox Cable on April 26th. Um, some uh, tips and uh, a welcome for anyone who wants to join the group. Uh, tomorrow night at the school committee meeting, um, the coalition, some members of the coalition will be presenting the campaign to change direction, um, five signs of mental health, um, and you're all welcome to watch the tape if you're interested in um, learning about some of the campaigns that we're running at the high school right now to help students. 
Um, this past Saturday, we had an Easter Bunny event at Cutie Curls at Tiverton Four Corners. Um, one of our high school students uh, was the Easter Bunny for part of their community service outreach. On Thursday, the 25th of this month, two students from the high school will be going to Ranger Elementary School and Fort Barton Elementary School for their um, annual um, anti-tobacco presentation. We've included this year um, vaping um, as more students are becoming aware uh, either from adults in their lives or older um, teens that they may know um, that are getting into those habits. Um, we are still reaching out to the Picasso School because we do try and include all three schools um, in hopes that they'll be able to um, have the presentation at Picasso as well. On Saturday, the 27th of April, is the um, National Drug Take Back Day, and we are again partnering with the um, Tiverton Police Department for um, an event from 10 to 2 at the police station where we will um, have members there. Anyone from the community can come um, and bring any um, drugs, no sharps and no liquids, please, um, and bring them and we'll uh, properly dispose of them. Um, we ask that they empty all their bottles into just some kind of resealable bag, plastic bag, recycle their actual pill containers, which would have their personal information on it, and just bring the bags um, to us. We'll be there from 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock at the police station with um, a police officer present as well, who will then take the uh, pounds and pounds of drugs that we get. Um, they drive them down to Warwick. Someone is there um, from the DEA, and they're um, incinerated somewhere. I don't know where, but it's good. And for anyone that can't participate, um, just again to say that the Tiverton Police Station does have a lockbox in their lobby that is accessible to anyone from anywhere. You do not have to be a Tiverton resident. Uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Oh, wait, there's one more. Um, and then lastly, the seventh grade is doing a vaping presentation. Where? She forgets where. No, they're, give, they're giving it to them. They're coming down from the high school. Yeah, oh, oh, the high school kids are going to the middle school and doing a vaping presentation. Um, the, so the tobacco presentation is for the fourth graders in town and then seventh graders at the middle school get a vaping presentation from our students that are members of the, uh, the teen coalition council that is at the high school. And then um, there's a Newport County Prevention Sponsored Opiate Forum at Community College of Rhode Island. No date given. That was what I was going to talk about. Oh, great, go. Part two. Okay, so um, the, we have the um, pass it up and pass it down. So the students from the high school have meetings with the parents. We call that pass it up to give them information. And then the pass it down is when they go to the middle, and now we're going down to the elementary. We didn't used to do that, but we're finding a need to do that now. So that's what those things are. So there was the, uh, the forum at CCRI. It was presented by the Newport County Prevention Coalition. And uh, the, the keynote speaker was Bertha Madras, a PhD, a member of the President's Commission on combating drug addiction and the opioid crisis. So she was the keynote speaker, and it was really well attended, and she just talked about everything that we know about how serious this is. So I'm so proud that the Newport County Prevention is, is uh, we're doing a lot of things with the faith and fire, I told you, with the faith communities, and it, it's very exciting. I've never seen it so active. Now that we've all combined, at first it was a little bit like, is this gonna work out, because you bring Newport and Middletown and Portsmouth and all of us together, we're all looking at each other, but it really is working out well, and I'm, I'm very excited, and the, whole, and the whole state is looking to us for best practice now, so we can all be very proud. Thank you very much. And the last thing is we'll thank Marsha for doing an article. Um, we had um, 11 students who did go down to Washington, D.C. We had talked to you about that before. They were doing a fundraising effort, and Sally is modeling school. their shirt that they made uh, and wore. <laughs> Um, but um, they were, um, there was an article highlighted in the Newport Daily News, which Sally will make sure that you all get a copy of. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you, Marcia, and thank you, your husband. He's the one that did the opioid story. So that was very nice. Thank you. Okay.
get the sheet for that? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so we have, um, well, there's two sign-ups, but they might both be on the agenda. And Mr. McLaughlin, public hearing item six. Six B. Okay, so that's public hearing, but we'll get right to that as soon as we get through um, the sound variance. And then Ms. Barbara Pelletier on the budget. We do have some discussion on the, the the budget with the FTR. I don't know if you'd like to wait till then or if this is something different. No, it's just an observation that I have on the how the budget worked out. Okay. It's very brief. Okay, are you staying for the whole meeting or? I can stay for the whole Is meeting, it? whatever. Okay, all right, well, why don't we hold it to that agenda item, if that's, if that's okay? All right. I won't stay past 11. Oh, neither will we. <laughs> neither will <laughs> so, we. <laughs> okay, all right, well, that, we had no other sign-ups for the open public forum, so we'll move right along uh, to our advertised public hearings. This is Mr. Justin Wilkie requesting an approval of sound variance for his wedding to be held on Family's Property, 329 King Road, that's September 15th, from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m., and an approval of a special event permit, of course, as always, subject to meeting all legal requirements. This is a public hearing. Would anybody like to be heard on this matter? A second call, would anybody like to be heard? Any questions or comments from the council? Okay, hearing none, we have a motion. I'll make a motion to... Uh I'll make a motion to approve a sound variance um, for September 15, 2019 at the property at 329 King Road from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Second. Okay. Last call for comments or questions. Hearing none, all those in favor? Okay. Approved as requested. Thank you. Congratulations. And then on the special event permit. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the special event permit, but I understand with the town clerk waiving the insurance requirement as alcohol is not being served at this particular event. Okay. And a second from Nancy? Second. All right, very well. All those in favor? Okay. All eyes are dotted and fees are crossed. Good luck and congratulations. Right. Thank you. Uh, we are still in public hearing. We're switching to item 6B. This is a public hearing application filing consideration for a small city's community development plant block grant statewide that's $5,437,000, and it's available to undertake the following range of activities. One would be improved housing opportunities for low and moderate income families and individuals. Also, provisions of employment opportunities for low and moderate income individuals, and then provision of community facilities and services principally benefiting low and moderate income families and individuals. This is an open public hearing. Does this have a sponsor? Uh, thank you. And um, I have some breaking news that developed after the agenda had been finalized. Uh, there is no application, so most likely there won't be a public hearing. Uh, the reason is that um, after the agenda was finalized, I had a meeting with the folks from uh, Church Community Housing Corporation and Christian Belden and Sean Saunders are here uh, from uh, that organization, the new executive director and deputy director. Uh, they um, shared some information that I hadn't had before. The most important piece, if I'm not mistaken, is that Right now, um, based on 2015 updated census data, we no longer have a low and moderate income district within the boundaries of Tivenet. Um, that's important for purposes of a lot of the grants that uh, are available uh, from the CDBG program. Um, it is somewhat surprising to a lot of us, uh, and it may change again or not once we have the 2020 uh, census data. Uh, it doesn't preclude uh, all activity or all uh, funding from the CDBG program, for example, the affordable housing program and other programs that serve a particular um, percentage of, of uh, low and moderate income households uh, can still go forward. 
Um, I thought it might be best if we ask probably Christian in the first instance to explain um, maybe a little bit more or to answer any questions you may have, unless you think that's not appropriate under the heading of public hearing, since it's not a public hearing. But I think we can probably explain it relatively quickly. There may be a later discussion needed of uh, what we then do, because one of the things they mentioned to me uh, is even though, for example, uh, a senior center project uh, could be uh, advanced for a grant, the work that's involved with that, together with the very low probability of getting the grant given the um, position the state program has taken on certain types of projects uh, with a big preference for fewer and larger projects and the senior center would simply not fill, fall within that category. At the same time, it would impose an amount of paperwork and other process that is uh, probably not worth it. Um, there's a larger issue here that at some point we may want to address at the state level, but it would go too far, I think, to get into it uh, tonight. Um, I ultimately included, and Bill Compton was there as well, the planner, um, that we probably would forego uh, the grant process here just like other communities have done. There is an opportunity in that case for the town to assign its, whatever you call it, slots to uh, another community that may be doing projects that will actually indirectly benefit or directly benefit people in Tiffin as well. So that's another discussion to have uh, whether the town council agrees that at least we can get something out of it that way. Uh, Basically, it would mean we um, defer to church community housing, which has been administering the CDBG program for us and all other communities in the East Bay uh, for many years now uh, to let them pursue what kind of opportunities there are like that, for example, uh, with projects that the city of Newport is undertaking. So yeah. going back to the suggestion that maybe you let Christian briefly explain you know <coughs> what he told me or if you have questions about it just have him answer your questions yeah can i just ask one quick question well, you said wanna... based on the census we no longer have a low low and moderate income oh, okay. which is a Shocking. it is uh, on the other hand um it, it may be an eye opener given that um the irony is that when you start working on uh, certain areas of town where you do have low and or always have had uh, a great concentration of low and moderate income households, uh, you start making improvements, there may well be a turnover uh, that changes you know, the demographics. And I think that may be happening. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. We'll know better after we have the new census data. So, no, that's, that's good news if it's, I'm just curious if it adjusts for things like cost of living. But in any event, so what you're saying is because we don't qualify for any of these low and moderate income bans, at least according to this program, the application is sort of mooted out. We can't. Okay. Well, why don't why don't we do this? It is a public hearing. I want at least anybody that came to talk. You know, Mr. McLaughlin wanted to be heard. Did you want to hear from these gentlemen first? I hear from these okay. First. Do you want to? I mean, we were expecting to be here. So. Sure. Would you be more comfortable seated, wherever you whatever you'd like? Of course, we have no chairs. Oh, yes. <laughs> Here's that. <laughs> Normally, I do come and sit at the table, but there wasn't any chairs this evening, so. Um. I'm just trying to move things along. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, counselors, for the opportunity to explain. Thank you, Jan, for that very comprehensive summary. Um, the CDBG program over the last few years has undergone um, big changes. It used to be that you applied once a year for any kind of CDBG app, um, activity that was eligible. CDBG funds always have to go to benefit low and moderate income persons. Uh, the first big change that the state made was to break out uh, a couple of types of applications that are now available on an ongoing rolling application basis. And those are um, affordable housing development, economic development, and housing rehab. <clears throat> so you can apply for those at any time during the year. Um, currently, there aren't any um, applicants looking to submit that kind of application. Um, but then the state also holds uh, an annual competitive application for public facility and public service activities 
um, if they're eligible. And as Jan explained, um, it used to be for many years, for as long as I've been doing this work, uh, that there was a, a block group in North Tiverton that um, had greater than 51% low and moderate income uh, residents. And this past year, just recently, as a matter of fact, HUD issued the, um, the statistics that you have to rely on to make the determination of whether or not you have an eligible uh, low mod income um, block group. And it's actually not based on census data. It's the 2010 to 2015 American Community Survey that they use. And the problem with this methodology is that when you pull up the um, the statistics, it lists the margin of error, and there, the margin of error ranges from, you know, a, a normal sort of margin of 5% to, I mean, there's 16% margin of error, 34% margin of error. So um, there, there are definitely some anomalies with this. Newport actually gained a couple of low mod block groups as a result of this, which especially in areas that really I don't think anybody thinks are legitimately low and moderate income. Um, but then Portsmouth and Tiverton uh, no longer have any low mod uh, block groups. Uh, once the 2020 census uh, comes out, hopefully that, you know, the, in terms of statistical significance, it's a much better resource for determining these things, and hopefully this will get corrected. But um, at this time, uh, there isn't a, a lo a, an identified low mod block group in Tiverton um, that the town could apply for. And then in a, on top of that, uh, the state has just stopped funding um, public facility and public service activities. Uh, it used to be that regional service providers like the Women's Resource Center, East Bay Community Action Program, um, Child and Family Services received uh, support for their programs every year from all of the communities in Newport County, and um, they don't anymore. Last year, uh, the only public service awards that were made in Newport County were for the, uh, the um, homeless shelter in Middletown, Lucy's Hearth, uh, the McKinney homeless shelter in Newport, and then to an organization called Housing Hotline, which also provides emergency motel sheltering. So those are really housing activities that got funded under the public service um, heading. But besides that, none of the the public service agencies received any CDBG funding this past year. And so um, at this point, uh, Little Compton and Portsmouth and Jamestown have all decided to not submit applications for CDBG funding this year and instead to transfer the, the slots. And when we refer to slots, um, the town has could, could apply for three public facility activities and two public service activities. Um, but at this point, you don't have any um, any projects that are really ready to go um, or that would score well and you don't have a low mod block group that you know you could apply for the sewer we expected that the north tiverton sewer expansion project would be applied for again this year it's received funding year after year after year it's been very successful um, but it's just not eligible this year so maybe when the new stats how long do we have a shot at um, 20, right? Yeah, 20 and times. I don't know when the actual <laughs> census results will be issued. I don't know that off the top of my head. Chris, when you say slots transferred, where, where, where do they go? Well, it, it just means that so you, um, the, the state wants to consolidate the applications because of the, the new, um, I, I don't know if it's priorities, but the this, this sort of streamlining that they're encouraging all of the towns to do, which is they want to, as Jan said, they, they want um, fewer, larger uh, projects to fund. Um, and <clears throat> so they, they are really hoping that, you know, like a county will identify a lead community, the smaller uh, municipalities will assign their public facility and public service slots to that lead community so that if there is a regional project, a project that benefits not just that lead community, but also uh, the, the municipalities that are um, transferring their slots, that, that that's what will happen, so that there can just be one award notice, one contract with, if it's Newport, you know, one contract with Newport, then there's just, you know, the environmental review process is only done for Newport, 
The quarterly progress reports are only done for Newport. So it's really uh, an effort by the state to uh, streamline and uh, diminish the administrative uh, efforts involved in having this project, this program, uh, fund every municipality in a county. Okay. Thank you. I didn't understand a thing you said. I'm it sorry. sounded like gobbledygook to me. <laughs> Honestly, uh, what do you mean? I still don't understand. It's almost like you're, like you're using slots as money. Like no, it's just opportunities to apply. So uh, if, the, if the town senior center or if the North Tiverton sewer expansion, these are individual projects that the town could apply for, those would, would each take up one public facility slot. So those would be two out of the three that the town is eligible to apply for. The state limits the number of activities and the types of activities that a town can apply for to three public facility activities and two public service activities. And so when I say transferring slots, I mean taking the opportunity to apply for those five activities and transferring them to another municipality so that if there is a regional project that could benefit not just that town, but also your town, that it gets applied for through that lead community. With that contractor, is it they trying to do one contractor? They're trying to do one contract. There aren't any contractors identified well, who, at this point. Well, who, who puts the program out so that it becomes regional and you, you then can apply? <coughs> the state. For the state. The state. Yeah, it's, it's administered by the Office of Housing and Community Development. Okay. So this sounds like bad news. And our next hope is... Yeah, the sewage. The, yeah. the system would be the... particularly on the sewer. Um, <coughs> more if, you mind, if you don't mind, just share. Um, Mr. McLaughlin, did you want to be heard on this? And yes, wanna, go ahead. Now's a good time. Uh, it's kind of relevant to what he got into. Uh, the public uh, facilities and activities uh, issue. Uh, we have the East Bay Community Action Center here in Tiverton, and that serves as Tiverton, Little Compton, and, and a good chunk of Portsmouth. And uh, I don't know if you people in this room know what they do out there. Uh, they help the low to moderate income and the elderly people uh, with food supplies and, and filling out paperwork and, and housing and a whole bunch of things. They're working out of a building. It's a third of the size of this room. And they have so much demand. And in previous years, they were still only able to service about 35 to 40 percent of the community that was asking for help. This past year, it's been 18 percent since they did that because they've cut down the, even the amount of hours they can operate. But in two six hour days, they clean a pantry out and there's people still looking for stuff. Uh, this money should be uh, available for something like this to expand an existing program and take the slots. If we talk to Portsmouth and Little Compton, uh, because the amount of people it, it used to benefit. Uh, I've worked with, it was way back, it was, uh, New Visions 30 years ago. I've worked with them in this town right up to the Community Action Center. And uh, in 19, uh, 2016, 2017, we've been doing this for 30 years. We got a lot of other groups, the, the VFW and the Elks and Knights got involved in helping families at Christmas time, which we do. And uh, the first time ever in history in 2016, there was 93 families that asked for help, all three nine, all 93 families got help. First time ever. In 2017, it was 113 families. We supplied, and the other organizations have done what we've set the example of, is supply age-appropriate gifts and Christmas dinner and the whole bit. And last year, because of what changed, we helped almost nobody. Uh, myself and, I don't know if Chief Jones is in the room, uh, we worked diligently to try to find families to help because the Community Action Center was actually not allowed to put any of these organizations that we've been setting up for years in touch with any clients to help them. They wanted all the resources that were donated for Tiverton residents to go to Middletown because they have a bigger facility that could hold all the toys and the food. And it was distributed as they thought was needed. So people in Middletown got toys that were actually intended for Tiverton residents. And just about nobody was helped in the town of Tiverton. Uh, 
uh, that, that's a great resource for us, and we have sold properties that would have been suitable for them to expand into uh, for next to nothing in this town. Uh, I know contractors would be glad to jump in and rehab any place that would, that would do that. Uh, but I think we should be looking at a grant to find a, a facility where they could expand, where they could help uh, get back up to at least 50% of the community or more being helped. Even at their best, their best, they, they weren't even getting 50%, 35 to 40%, down to 18 after what he just told you because of the way they were running things. This town should have a little bit of responsibility for its residents, especially the, the low income and the elderly, especially the elderly who paid into this town forever in, in our infrastructure to help them out. So I think we need to find a way, and if you need help with the paperwork, I'll be glad to come spend freaking 10, 15 hours a week. We'll get the paperwork done. But there are people in this town in, in, in a need, and we have the opportunity here to maybe get a state grant, maybe not, but at the very least, we're bringing it to the forefront that we should do something to expand a facility that was helping almost half and now helps almost nobody. And, and it done right and expanded could help maybe 80% or more of the people in this town that need it. They have the offering, they, they got the donations, they just have no way to distribute it. So I think it's up to the people sitting here to figure out how we do that. I'm on board with anything I can do to help. And I, I can speak for a bunch of other contractors in the area. But I think it's something we should address. And he says there are grants available for it. Talk to Tiverton, I mean talk to uh, Portsmouth and Little and see if they're willing to throw their slots our way. And, and there's gotta be a way to have it relooked. I, I find it hard to believe there's uh, no slots with low income and, and I know a bunch of people in this town personally that, that are just about getting by, and I'm sure everybody else does in this room, so I find it hard to believe. It would be nice, you know, if we were that economically successful, but I don't believe we are, and I don't know where they get the statistics, but it's, there's gotta be a way to straighten it out and help the people. Thank you. Can I, can I respond to yeah, that? Yeah, um, so I, I completely agree with everything that you said. Uh, I have been doing this job for 11 years now, and I used to come to these exact hearings with uh, Sue Skank from East Bay CAP, and they were applying for CDBG funding, and they've just stopped applying because they stopped getting funding. They, uh, they just. If you're going to do it, I've actually gone with people, and you get people like Mr. Royce, who's running it. They're all finger pointing. Oh, it's not my job. Go talk to him. Oh, it's not no, my no, job. It's not, so you get a run it's around. It's not that. No, they apply. They Be just kept applying year after year after year without getting any funding, and then have just stopped. Where we're my whole point? Because nobody wants to take the responsibility and say yes unless there's somebody. No, know, it's just that the Jack, state. The state Jack is Reed or somebody funds. calls up and goes, "Hey, that's my buddy over there. Help him out." I, um, I mean, so, you know, we we just. Ad help the town administer this program. And we're reaching out to East Bay Community Action again this year to ask them if they want to submit an application. Um, but I'm not uh, optimistic that they're going to, just because after so many years of applying and not getting funding, they, they just have given up on it at this point. I, I just think. where the town needs to be, the town best advocates, we have representatives, they were here a couple of meetings ago. Why don't we use that resource? There's got to be a way to bring this to the forefront. Uh, it's kind of important. You know, you're, gonna, you're gonna give this big money grants to some company that's gonna make a ton of money and help very few people when it wouldn't take a ton of money to help a lot of people here in Tiverton, even if we gotta find it in our own budget. Mr. Minister, did you wanna? Yes, yeah, okay. Uh, I mentioned that I think there is a bigger issue here that um, arguably would justify us trying to sit down with our um, state and perhaps congressional representatives and talk about what's going on with the CDBG program and what has changed over the years and whether that's the direction that from a legislative perspective you actually want to see the program go into. Um, they have had complaints about not having enough staff resources to administer all of this across you know, all the municipalities. They may have a point there, but ultimately it would make sense to have a discussion of is this program serving uh, communities the way it was always meant to do or not. And in my previous position, I had the same concern. There are lots of other folks in other towns who have a concern uh, with the direction this program has taken. And um, 
I think it would not be uh, unreasonable for the council to, uh, you know, direct me or however you want to do it to initiate a discussion with uh, sort of in the political arena and say, can we sit down and have this discussion? I said the same thing to the folks from uh, Church Community Housing, and, you know, we can team up with people from the other communities who have similar yeah, frustration. Uh, Mr. Dilgash might be able to give us a little hand there, Tom. Nice article. Okay, well, why don't we make sure, does anybody else want to be heard from the public on, on this matter, the open public hearing? Okay. Any other comments? Yep. Well, I, do, I do have a question. Just to, so it sounds like what we're hearing is the state used to fund this particular program that Mr. McLovin's talking about, but the criteria basically for what projects were funded started to change at the state level, and so the funding stopped, and they said, well, <clears throat> why bother applying? So that's, that's the history of that program. Now, does our not having any el eligible districts preclude that application anyway? No. Now, there are a couple of different types of CDBG applications. There's an area benefit application, which is what the North Tiverton sewer expansion project was because it benefited uh, a, an area that was defined by a block group that had more than 51% low mod residents. And then there are also limited clientele applications, which is if you're the East Bay Community Action Program and you do income certification of the clients that you serve, then they know that the state knows that the CDBG funds are going to benefit a limited clientele who are certified to be low and moderate income because the agency is doing income certifications. And so, um, it, it could still be applied for, and as I said, we're reaching out to, to EBCAP to see if they do want to apply this year, but we also did last year and the year before, and they didn't apply then because they applied so many times in prior years and didn't get any funding. Well, you know what might have changed in the, <clears throat> in the criteria to, to lessen the likelihood of their being funded? or uh, it, Well, it's actually that Rhode Island um, operated unusually from the majority of the states in the United States in terms of how its CDBG program was administered. It was very common that um, most every town would receive some amount of CDBG funding um, and it would come in in small amounts for the, the local regional service providers like East Bay CAP or Women's Resource Center. And so, you know, Tiverton might get a $5,000 grant to support the Women's Resource Center, but only 15% of the total amount of CDBG funding that's eligible is supposed to go to fund public service programs according to the federal regulations that govern CDBG. So it was always only supposed to be a small percentage of the overall funding that was awarded through CDBG in the state anyhow. Um, and uh, a few years ago, there was a, a HUD audit of the state program, and basically the state got the the directive that they needed to change their ways and um, stop funding so many public service applications, and that's what's happened. You know, it's a catch-22 situation, too, because it's funding dried up. Uh, even out here, because it's such a small facility, they can't run everything they can do at once. They got one day for doing people for rowing from their application, <coughs> another day for housing. Up. So what happens is they're actually helping less people, so when they do HUD or somebody does their audit, they're going, oh, well, you only help this many people. It's not because there's not a demand. It's because they're not able to because the facility is so small and because each year it looks like they're helping less because they are, unfortunately. They're getting less funding, so it's, it's kind of self-shrinking, catch-22. There's still a demand out there, but because, it, it, unfortunately, this is such a small facility, it's really hurting them because they can only do one activity at a time out there. When they have the staff, they could be doing multiple <clears throat> activities. So, I, for the administrator, what would we be trying to effectuate by talking to representatives, trying to get distributed funds more equitably, or try to push back on HUD on the limit they're putting on these types of programs? Or um, <clears throat> well, in the first instance, I think it would be good for. Um, those folks, and I'm, I'm talking about the congressional delegation probably in particular, to, to see if they know how this program is currently administered and to what extent, you know, the needs in communities like Tiverton are being met or not. Um, ultimately, it's both the federal and the state 
legislative issue. So I think it would be worthwhile to talk with our uh, state representatives as well and say, you know, we, we know we're not the only community that has these concerns. And can we get some sort of a discussion going uh, as to whether uh, perhaps this program ought to you know, try to change direction somewhat so that you know, worthwhile and needed projects can actually get, get funded in places where they are needed. Um, there's no guarantee that it will actually produce you know, results, but if we don't try something, then we know there won't be any results. I mean, it, it, almost, <laughs> it almost sounds like the HUD program is being cut back. At the, at the federal level, and the states aren't getting what they used to get, so. That, that was true three and four years ago. It was cut by about 30 percent. This yeah. last year, it overall actually had a s small increase to the, the entire national budget for CDBG, um, but it's really just HUD telling Rhode Island how yeah. to administer its program. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <coughs> Need a formal vote? As I mean, I'm sure there's no objection from the council for the administrator to continue work. Okay. Uh, last call. Anybody else wish to be heard on this matter? Okay. Thanks for coming out. It was really helpful. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to our next public hearing. We have Director Rogers. This is a request approval to submit to Rhode Island DEM the ESS Group RIP DES Small MS4 Annual Report <laughs> for 2018. Has a lot of letters and acronyms. Reminds me of my military days. Can you explain uh, how all, if all of that for us, please? Yes. Uh, Rick Rogers, DPW, and Matt Laidwig from ESS Group Incorporated is here. And this is the 15th year of the annual report uh, for the uh, small municipality stormwater report to DEM, and that's required by DEM uh, once a year. And it's a draft form now because you have to have a public presentation. Any public comments received have to be incorporated, and you have to note to DEM when the report uh, was heard. So there's four items, the date, signing, public comments that have to be incorporated. That's why it's a draft. Okay. And, and Matt has uh, input. I just want to break it down a little bit more because uh, there's a lot in this report um, and it's a little bit difficult to understand, especially with all the acronyms. So. Uh, your, isn't, your last name just for our yes opinion. Matt Ladwig from ESS group um, so essentially uh, as director Rogers said this is a required report uh, this is the 15th year uh, the town is covered by a general permit uh, for stormwater discharge from its municipal separate storm sewer system and the permit asks the town to address six minimum control measures as part of its annual reporting. Um, the first is public outreach and education. The second is public participation. So this meeting in, uh, is included in that. Uh, the third is illicit discharge detection and elimination. The fourth is construction site stormwater runoff control. The fifth minimum control measure is post-construction stormwater management and new and redevelopment. And then the last one, the sixth one, is pollution prevention and good housekeeping. So the report, that, the draft report that you received is broken into these six sections and basically talks about what the town has done in the last year to address each of these minimum control measures. Okay, with that, this is an open public hearing. Would anybody like to be heard? Any questions or comments or concerns? The floor is open. You're here to demonstrate our Public input. Sure. Thank you. <clears throat> I just want to um, add something. Um, when I looked at a previous version of the report and a little bit into the history of how we develop these reports every year, I had to ask myself, what does it really mean? Um, because we submit these reports and they get approved or accepted by DEM. 
it doesn't necessarily mean that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing when it comes to stormwater management in this town, or that we're doing as well as perhaps we should try to be doing. So we started taking a little bit more serious look at, okay, what is the stormwater management program that the town has? Uh, we discovered that uh, an ordinance that was mentioned for several years in this report uh, actually was still not on the website as part of the town code of ordinances, which makes you wonder how well we enforce it, um, things like that. But also knowing, and we've talked about this a little bit uh, in, in recent times, that this town is experiencing increasing problems with stormwater uh, in all seasons. And uh, it's getting worse with the kinds of rainstorms that we're seeing uh, everywhere. Uh, and you know, the stormwater essentially is overwhelming uh, the systems such as the eye that we have to manage them. So you have a lot of water running down the roads, running into the bay, uh, filling up basements, uh, what have you. And I think it's time that we take a closer look at what is really um, the solution here. One thing I wanted to mention is that uh, we took some of the results that we saw in the report and said, now, can we do something, for example, with a grant? So we just recently applied for grants to do something about the stormwater issues in particular in the Robert Gray uh, area. Um, and if we get that grant, then we can start taking a closer look at what can be done on the smaller private properties or in combination between private property owners and the town in terms of its drainage system in that area. And I think that's how this report can and should be used, that we identify areas where you know, perhaps we can do more. We're supposed to do a lot about what's called illicit discharge uh, detection. Um, we detect it, but... <laughs>
not to receive town coverage. They will um, receive a payment in lieu of health insurance valued at 35% of the town's premium, uh, which um, is uh, an overall savings to the town if, if the member is not receiving a benefit of sixteen to eighteen thousand um, dollars the town would be paying thirty five percent of that savings back to the member and the town would be um, uh, seeing a sixty five percent reduction in the premium rate uh, for that particular firefighter for retirees there uh, it's a it's a little bit complicated but I'll walk through it as best I can uh, for employees hired prior to July 31st, 2018, if and when they retire with at least 20 years of service to the Town of Tiverton Fire Department, the town will provide the employee with the same health care that they receive in active employment. Under the expired contract, firefighters would shift from the high deductible health plan to a much more costly plan, a, um, a HealthMate coast-to-coast -coast plan. Under the uh, tentative agreement, firefighters would switch to, would keep their health insurance plan, the 2004-4000 high deductible plan. And for the first 10 years of retirement, the town would make a contribution or a payment to the individual retiree in the amount of half of the deductible. Uh, when you net out the cost savings, in the uh, changed health plan uh, and you add in the, um, to the, the half deductible payment that's paid to the retiree, there still is a substantial savings to the tune of several thousand dollars per year per firefighter in each year of retirement. Um, the, the, that payment would last for uh, no more than 10 years or until the retiree reach Medicare eligibility, whatever, whichever occurs first. And then upon reaching Medicare eligibility, the retiree would go off of the high deductible health plan, would be given a gap coverage plan 65 plan, and the retiree would be responsible for paying uh, Medicare Part B uh, uh, premiums or payments uh, on their own. Um, there's another uh, provision that's built in. If a retiree provides the town with at least six months written irrevocable notice of retirement, the town will pay that first year's half deductible payment while the employee, while the uh, firefighter is still employed by the town. So the town does not pay any additional money, but the town makes that contribution into the retiree's HSA plan. So the town actually saves a little bit on Medicare uh, contributions, but the retiree is able to take that uh, first year's retirement payment into retirement uh, in a tax-free vehicle through the HSA plan. For retirees, um, these are employees who are hired on or after July 31st, 2018. These are new hires. If they retire with at least 25 years of service to the town's uh, fire department, they will receive a different benefit. They will have a choice of two options. Option one will be 10 uh, um, and they will receive individual coverage through the $2,000 uh, high deductible health plan until Medicare eligibility, or they will receive five years of family coverage, a maximum of five years, under the $4,000 uh, high deductible health plan, um, and then no further coverage, no f further coverage beyond the five years or Medicare eligibility for the uh, firefighter, and the town would not be making any contribution to the individual firefighter's uh, HSA account. Uh, as they would for the um, existing employees. Um, for retirees who retire on an accidental work-related disability, the town would agree to waive the years of service requirement, the 20 years of service requirement, and the 25 years of service requirement for employees hired on or before July 31st of 2018. And for newer hires, those hired on or uh, those hired after July 31st, 2018, if the employee is totally disabled as determined by eligibility for SSDI, then the individual would receive the same health benefits in retirement that they would have received um, had they not been disabled, notwithstanding the fact that they did not serve 25 years for the department. If the employee is not deemed completely and totally disabled, 
they would be capped out at 10 years uh, for, that, uh, for that coverage in retirement. Um, moving on from health care, the town would agree to increase uh, the incentive for EMTC and EMT paramedic uh, uh, certificates. For EMTC, which is EMT cardiac certificates, Effective July 1 of 2019, firefighters would receive $62.50 per week. And for EMT paramedics, effective on July 1, 2019, uh, the, the uh, town would pay $72.50 uh, to those firefighters with that certificate. In addition to these changes, the town would make changes to conform to the Janus decision from the United States Supreme Court which prohibits mandatory uh, fees paid uh, by non-members of a union. Uh, those changes would be made to the, to the contract. The town would keep the, uh, there's a provision in the contract which states once the town uh, expends $185,000 in overtime, there would be a new way of paying overtime under the contract, and that new way of paying would strictly conform to the uh, what's called Section 7K of the Fair Labor Standards Act, the Federal Fair Labor Standards Act, which if the town hit that point uh, in paying uh, 185000 in overtime in a fiscal year, uh, the, the, the payments for overtime would only be made if a firefighter actually worked over 212 hours in a 28-day period. That's a significant change from the way that overtime is, is currently paid. Um, the parties would agree to reduce the minimum uh, require, uh, hours requirement for a callback. Right now, under the expired contract, if a firefighter is called back to duty, he or she is entitled to three hours of overtime pay, uh, regardless of the length of the callback. That would be reduced to two hours. The agreement calls for several uh, pension reform changes, really to comply with the law. Uh, the firefighters are in the state retirement system, and the uh, agreement would be amended to really conform to the uh, state and local uh, retirement pension provisions that are in place and not to depart from those. The, the agreement would provide that all details uh, would be scheduled by the town as opposed to the union, and this relates to scheduling for the details at the, at the casino. Um, the expired agreement provided that the union would provide all scheduling for those details. The town would, um, uh, there's a life insurance benefit in the contract, and currently the town makes a, uh, writes out a check to the union, and the union provides the life insurance. The parties agreed that the town would be procuring or finding uh, life insurance at the same value, $60,000 per member, uh, but paying for the insurance premiums directly. Um, and the town uh, anticipates being able to save uh, money on, on going out and getting life insurance on their own rather than through the union's provider. The, there are a few other uh, changes in the agreement. For example, there's a uh, reduction in the years of eligibility for uh, to become a lieutenant from five years to three years, and that tracks uh, some temporary agreements that were made um, during the course of this current contract to open up the pool for uh, eligible uh, firefighters to become lieutenants. The firefighters made some, I mean, and the town made some changes to the grievance procedure really to clean it up. Um, I can go through those in detail if you have any specific questions. And uh, there were some changes to the uniforms, allowing uh, or changing the, year, the time in which short sleeves or shorts can be worn, um, just so that there's no um, uh, conflict with uh, rules and regulations. You know, the, we started off, when I started off, and as young as the town administrator had started with the main provisions, this is a 15-page agreement uh, with you know, you even tackled several minor changes in the agreement, uh, which could have significance to the town, such as the grievance changes um, and some of the others. But the main provisions of the agreement are the staffing, the schedule change, the minimum staffing change, the active and post-employment health in insurance changes, and the, uh, the wage provisions, Signif most significantly the pay freeze for a three-year period, followed by 
what's slightly over a 2% pay increase in the final year of the contract. So that's the, that's the, the changes in a nutshell. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have on specific uh, changes in the agreement. Um, and I know we, we also attached a fiscal impact statement, which I could talk to generally, but I think specific questions should be directed at, at others other than myself. Okay, so as you can see, uh, there's a lot of content and frankly a lot of work. That was just the summary. And I guess I'll, uh, I have a lot of thank yous to give, but first I want to go ahead and open it up. I want to make sure that um, we actually have our uh, lead negotiator from our firefighter team here. If you want, want to add anything, if you think we missed anything, the floor is open for any public questions or comments. The goal here is to get this out in the open instead of uh, you know, have a I guess we have two, two weeks or so to, uh, if you see any, any errors or anything, um, I'd love to hear about it. Any questions or comments from the public? I have one question. Um, when you talk about um, 20 years of service, I think a continuous service, what I know there's some places it just says service, a couple, sometimes it says continuous service. Is, that, is, there, is there a difference? Is that a, does that word have a significance? I mean, one, one time I saw a definition that if you have an unexplained absence for over a month, I think, or something, then that's a, that's a break in your service, and I didn't know whether. I'm, it, I'm specifically looking at page seven of, of this. Yeah, page seven, and it's, it's uh, stated again on, I believe, page eight. Uh -huh. uh, with the 25 years of continuous service, yeah. newer hires and 20 years of continuous service, um, that is that is stated um, to capture firefighters that have been with the town's fire department continuously and haven't been, um, you know, haven't had a break in service where they've left employment and then come back. Um, you know, if there's a temporary leave of absence or a temporary illness or an FMLA covered illness, that would still be considered a. Uh, a continuous service. Okay. This is really right. for somebody who, um, you know, for some reason goes out of the firefighting service, leaves, and then comes back to the town or potentially takes employment elsewhere and then comes back to the town. Um, it would also exclude military service okay. under, the, um, under the federal um, statute that covers military leaves of absence uh, and some state provisions as well. Um, tours of duty are uh, most tours of duty, if not all tours of duty, are, con are must be counted as continuous service to the town. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, do we need a? Do you want to? Can we give you? Do you want a formal? I mean, it is the intent of this council to, I, I believe, approve this contract formally in two weeks, unless uh, we have feedback in this case, um, some other factor. Some kind of a tentative vote, or what is your? What would you like? To I do? think it would be very helpful for the council to state, uh, if it's in fact the case that you support the tentative agreement, that you uh, state that clearly. There, there are a bunch of reasons for that. Among them, what's going on in the general assembly uh, right now, and, and knowing that we're heading in this direction uh, may be important for folks in the general assembly to note. Um, but it's also very important, I think, for our union and for the firefighters who uh, have been waiting for a long, long time, you know, for some sort of certainty that we're heading to uh, a situation where uh, we manage to balance things out and hopefully can start stabilizing the department. So from that perspective, uh, the sooner we send a strong signal, the better from my perspective. I have a question on that. Did we make any provision for if the General Assembly does pass that legislation to try to get the second, the three-year provision under the wire, or did, have we determined that legally <clears throat> that that's a moot point? Or we've been we've been told, and in, in the legislation, as with much of Rhode Island's legislation, is not entirely clear. Um, and the way that it's proposed right now, it states the current. I can read to you um, the legislation, but it states that. Um, the act shall take effect upon passage, except that the terms of current firefighters' collective bargaining agreement uh, that conflict 
with this act shall remain in effect until the contract expires when the act shall begin to apply to those covered firefighters. So at this point, it's difficult to... You have that in, in only one of the two bills I just noticed today. Yes. And actually the one that is the 42-hour provision doesn't have that provision in it, which to me is very problematic. Uh, more likely than not, they will say, well, we, we mean it to apply in both cases. Uh, we're still taking strong exception to this, and I took it upon myself to let our uh, delegation know that this is problematic, A, because it could still jeopardize this particular agreement, uh, and B, because long-term we don't think this is an appropriate uh, interference in, in local authority. Yeah, so there is, to answer the question, there, there hasn't been a specific carve out or anything dealing with this. There is a provision of the contract or the, the tentative agreement that calls for uh, the parties to have non-binding discussions on overtime and other items throughout the agreement, but that, that contemplated something else other than this. I mean, the legislation, as you know, came about um, sort of on the 11th hour during these negotiations, and um, it's, it's undetermined when um, if at all, at this point, it will be passed and signed into law. Um, I, I can't handicap that at this point. If it does kick in, it will, uh, as drafted right now, uh, affect the town at some point. The question is when. Um, and we really need to see the final language of that legislation before we can... But I think what it also means, and I should have pointed that out, that if, in fact, the council... Um, approves or endorses the tentative agreement. Uh, the contracts got posted, but they're not yet executed. Um, <clears throat> the council probably should, in its vote or decision or whatever, say something about uh, the possibility of having to convene a special meeting to do the final ratification vote earlier than the 22nd, if necessary. Right now, we just don't know. Tomorrow, uh, the House vote is happening. This is all of a sudden, even though we were told that this would probably not go very fast, it's going extremely fast. And so tomorrow's the vote in the House. Uh, the Senate hasn't been scheduled yet, but it could happen any time. So we're going to track that very closely. And uh, you may want to have a contingency in whatever you decide about the posting and the final ratification vote. Okay. Oh. Uh, the schedule is an exhibit B uh, in the tentative agreement. This is that's the one piece that the parties are uh, in verbal agreement on, um, but it's not attached to this. I can walk through exactly with you what the schedule is. It's been completely vetted, as you know, uh, at the bargaining table. The way that that schedule is is going to be laid out will be an exhibit B to, this is complicated, to the, uh, I believe it's exhibit C in the contract because that change does not kick in automatically. That change will kick in upon the, uh, the fire department hiring its 28th uh, line firefighter. When that <clears throat> occurs, which is hopefully sooner rather than later, there will be, the way we have it structured, there's language that automatically takes effect in the collective bargaining agreement, including that schedule change. Um, and we've exchanged um, the way that that language uh, should read. And we are very close in, in terms of that language. We're, we're both talking about the exact same schedule, uh, but that was not attached to your, um, to the packet. Okay. Quite frankly, it would be a little confusing having there's already uh, this layering of documents, and then there would be an Exhibit B to an Exhibit C to two collective bargaining agreements, and it got a little onerous. Okay. Thank you. You're very welcome. I'd like to just ask one question about the vetting of the fiscal impact statement. I know when we last discussed this, there were going to be multiple reviews of this so that we were sure it was correct. Is that process happened? Yes. Okay. It has been reviewed. I, I always ask the treasurer to take a look at, you know, the numbers and, and see if there's anything. Then she spotted something the last time. It was corrected, and it happened this time. She noted that the issues that she had um, raised previously had been addressed. 
and she didn't see any, you know, any other issues with the analysis. Thank you. I just asked him um, on that last point, did, did, was there any, just for the purpose of a public, remember the public trying to read that contract, is there a different way to paginate or, or label those exhibits so it's exhibit one, two, exhibit C? Or, so I know it's a petty point there, but I've read so many of these things and they're hard enough. Yeah, the, the best way to explain it is there's the tentative agreement document. And the tentative agreement document is a 15-page document labeled tentative agreement with the March 26, 2019 date uh, on the top right-hand corner. That document is drafted to specifically and expressly state how the collective bargaining agreement will be amended. So if you, if you look at the tentative agreement, and put it side by side to the collective bargaining agreement. It shows you exactly how that collective bargaining agreement will be amended. But we took the additional step and actually amended the collective bargaining agreement uh, in red line form. So in the packet, there is a red line collective bargaining agreement that already incorporates that tentative agreement into it. But because we have two collective bargaining agreements, that's been done twice. And because we have two different time periods with certain provisions kicking in at certain time periods. The one contract, for example, the contract that covers this fiscal year does not have the changes in it to EMTP pay or EMT paramedic pay that take place next year. So it, 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 it takes the relevant provisions and puts them in there. That's the best way that I can explain it. Is I guess my question is, at, at the end of this process, when there is a new agreement and it has been adopted, there will not be lettered exhibits to a letter correct? Correct. There will be, there will be, <laughs> at any given, at, there will be a four-year period. And during year one, there will be a one-year contract, a collective bargaining agreement of approximately 45 pages. And that collective bargaining agreement will have three exhibits to it, exhibit A or appendix A, B, and C. When that contract expires on June 30th of 2019, it will be supplanted by a three-year collective bargaining agreement that's structured the same way with slightly different terms, about a 44-page document with three exhibits, A, B, and C. You're welcome. <coughs> Sir. Is that right? <clears throat> Craig Camito, um, president of the uh, Firefighters Association. So. Um, I just want to say a couple of things. So this process um, has been a long drawn out process for about well over 18 months now. Um, this is probably one of the most complicated contracts I ever negotiated. Um, we need to get our ship steady. We need to move on. We have a lot of problems in the fire department. Um, a lot of this contract um, came from the previous council. Um, they started the ball. Uh, this council has picked up and finished the ball, um, and it, like, like I said, it's one of the most complicated contracts we've settled. We have manpower issues, we have safety issues, um, we understand the fact of health care costs and everything, so um, any type of support that we could get with this and, and to move this department forward, keep the ship steady, it'd be well appreciated. Um, it, it's been a, a real hard coming together on this, and I think negotiations have, have gone very well. Um, you know, Jan leading the charge, and uh, you know, Tim working with us, and, and just trying to come up with a, a plan for all. Um, I think this plan, this contract has to, there's so much vetted into it that both sides have to work at this contract to make it work, and I think that's the biggest thing that came out of this, both sides, the town side and us. If the town side doesn't work, um, their due diligence and us, it won't work. If we work together, this should, this should work and hopefully solve some issues. Thank you. Thank you. you know, I want to second that. I mean, I was, I was surprised at the negotiations. We only had to invoke the rock, paper, scissors clause like three or four times to resolve our problems. Um, but I, that was one of the biggest, um, most important parts for me is that there are incentives and reasons built into this contract and, and actual statements that we'll meet regularly, discuss issues, and it'll be a collaborative uh, thing moving forward, and I think that that's very important. Uh, and also some of the other provisions, I think we we started to take a look at the the fire department interpreting as a career path. So obviously with the four platoons, there will be more opportunities for increased rank, um, and we also increase pro probationary pay. Um, and we also 
the per diem provision could also start to help supply new firefighters to the department. And even the, uh, the allowing them to wear t-shirts in hot weather, I think that'll help <laughs> keep people well motivated. So I, th I think we're, we're definitely headed in the right direction on this. And uh, for that reason, I'd like to move that we post all necessary documents to the town's website for public transparency according to the law with the expectation that at our next meeting we will ratify this agreement or these two agreements. And uh, you added that with the understanding that if uh, legislative action dictates there may be a prior uh, meeting as opposed to the next regular right. with the, Yeah, with the, with the understanding that if, if necessary we can accelerate the process with this, a special meeting. Can we even go further and instead of just posting actually motion to tentatively approve? Well, from an open meetings and from, <laughs> is that, is I want to send the strongest possible signal of our appreciation for this, this work, and I, I think you're going to see a Okay, can I just vote. say one thing about the legislation? So, so from what I'm told from my leadership throughout the state is that if, if we have an agreement in place before all this stuff um, takes effect, um, it will eventually affect the town, but it, it should be four years from now. So we'll have time to prepare and get back to the table to hopefully work on something else. So that, that's what I'm told from my leadership, and I, I've passed that on, so it's just another little piece of the puzzle. To answer your question, Mr. President, the, 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 there's no such thing legally as a tentative approval. Right. Um, so I think if, if Mr. Uh, Katz's, Council Katz's motion uh, and, and perhaps a roll call uh, or would suffice to uh, mm -hmm. indicate as clearly okay. as possible um, the, the opinion of the council, I don't think there's anything more that you can do subject to the final approval, or subsequent to the, or prior to the final approval. I guess the, the question then, is, so there's obviously the legal requirement of what the three days of posting, do we want to allow more time than that? Or, I mean, I'm happy to, to say it will be done on this date according to this vote. Um, but we just have to determine what, what date that ought to be. It, seem, it, it strikes me that there's some pressure going with the legislation that if we do it sooner rather than later, we might be safer, right? I, no, but it has to be out there for three days. I understand that. I'm not saying shorten the three yeah. days, but maybe not two weeks. <laughs> so what I, I think the House vote is tomorrow, so we'll have that data for sure. And then I suppose if that does not pass the House, that provides some cushion. And if it does pass the House, it has not yet been scheduled in the Senate. There's a certain organization that notifies us when it's up for a vote. Right. Um, oh. and, and, <laughs> and, and even then, it would still have to get transmitted to the governor, yeah. and the governor would have a certain right. amount of time to either approve or deny 10 days if, if it go right. yeah. out of veto. It would so have to be. There's, there's a window, uh, certainly, of at least three days if the Senate decides to move the vote, but I wouldn't uh, you know, push it. Yeah, will there be the Senate committee, Labor Committee will have to hear it, then it'll go to the floor. If there are any differences, they'll have to be reconciled, and the other chamber will have to pass that legislation, and then it goes to the governor. And they don't, they don't suspend those rules typically until the end when they say, yeah, anything goes. So they'll be following their, their rules usually for the next couple of weeks anyway. So well, just to be clear, technically we don't have a reconciliation requirement. It, it, it is done that way in practice, but, but the General Assembly can pass one or the other bill. Right, but, but if the Senate amends or puts something for, different forward than what the House passed already, the House will have to pass that, and that's sort of the mechanism for reconciling the two. Mr. President, might I suggest that we move forward with the vote and our town administrator can keep an eye on the General Assembly, and if he feels that uh, we need to reconvene in a shorter time period, he could let us know? I think that's exactly what we'll, we'll do. This would be scheduled for Nancy's purposes at the April 22nd meeting as we've indicated in the agenda. If not sooner. At, at the very latest. Okay. Not sooner. Okay, so first, may I have a second to the motion? Second. second. All right, I heard a second from Mr. Perry. Um, call for a roll call vote, uh, starting with Councillor Perry. Yes. Have an eye. Councillor Hilton. Yes. Councillor Katz. Yes. Uh, and I also just want to make sure that, and I'll probably say it again, but a particular thank you. Um, to our negotiation team led by the town administrator and of course also on our team on the firefighter side and I think this is a good
deal for the town, a good deal for the taxpayers, and a good deal for the firefighters, and the chair will vote aye. Councillor Cook? Yes. And Councillor Drew? Yes. That is 6 0, uh, signaling our tentative support. And thank you so much. Should we move on now to the per diem issue? Uh, and then we have a little confidence. We have two other personnel related matters. Thank you. So you have um, a draft resolution. Um, I put on the counter before the meeting the latest version, clean version of that. <clears throat> um, you saw an initial draft that has been reviewed and edited by uh, Labor Council. And um, the need for this is both because of the uh, tentative agreement and the contract that you have just discussed and because we have currently an urgent need to be able to hire folks um, because we have five to six vacancies uh, already and also because um, we have fewer uh, sign-ups for the details at the casino. So being able to hire on a per diem basis or a part-time basis uh, we'll be able to uh, provide almost immediate relief uh, to the department so that we, among other things, can avoid uh, a huge increase in, uh, in overtime. So um, I think the resolution speaks for itself. Uh, I do want to point out that this would uh, authorize the fire chief with my approval to hire up to 15 qualified candidates at an hourly rate. It says here uh, not to 20, not to exceed $20 uh, dollars per hour. It's still highlighted because I'm not entirely sure exactly what that rate is going to be, although I'm comfortable with the solution saying that up to, up to $20 an hour at this point in time, unless the acting chief has serious concerns with, uh, with that number. Okay, so I'm not going to read the entire two pages of recitals and resolutions, but I'll give you the very brief summary or the key language is that this resolution would permit the council to hire qualified part-time and per diem firefighters meeting the minimum criteria, authorizing the fire chief to assign them to regular shifts as well as the casino. It will also, as was just stated with the approval of town administrator, up to 15 qualified candidates as needed at an hourly rate not to exceed $20. We would also be developing a per diem hiring policy and this would be included in monthly reports. That's a summary of what this uh, recitals and resolutions would do. Does anybody from the public wish to be heard on the per diem <coughs> resolution? Second call. Will there be a motion to approve as presented? So moved. Can I have a second? I'll second. second. The floor is open for any further questions or comments. I have just a few questions. Um, obviously per diems are not um, entitled to benefits, but we would cover them if they were injured or disabled on the job, correct? Correct. The, the statute uh, does cover them to, uh, to some extent, and, and you, you can't avoid what the law requires. Okay. And, and do we need to increase our insurance to, to cover that? In other words, if we hire 15 per diems, do we need to increase our insurance premium? How does the, I don't Not know how that works. necessarily, I think, but it definitely we need to discuss it with the trust. Okay. Um, and then the funding for the per diems, although this doesn't have any impact to do with the contract and it's not the firefighters issue, I, it, I just want to ask this question. The plan for funding the per diems is out of that overtime account. Is that the current plan? That's how it currently is, is planned. There was some discussion of whether it should be uh, broken out and, and have its own separate uh, line item uh, account and the pros and cons to, to it. Um, to some extent, you might say you have more transparency if in the budget it's on its face clear that you know, money is set aside to pay for per diems. On the other hand, the exact proportion of how many per diems uh, versus active uh, fi full line fi what is it called line full firefighters, time, full time firefighters. <clears throat> um, is it, it fluctuates all the time so having some flexibility actually probably makes more sense I, I mean that part I'm not so worried about I mean I think the treasurer probably is the one to however she wants to work that um, 
again, it, it, it won't stop me from voting for this resolution. I'm still a little worried, and I'll just say this, that based on how short we are right now of personnel in the fire department, um, that I'm a little worried that we're putting a lot of um, we're putting a lot of burden on an overtime account that was cut by the budget committee, um, and we may have to, you know, at some point figure out where we're going with this. But um, those answer my two questions. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Any objection to proceeding the vote? Hearing none. All those in favor? All right, part three, Mr. Administrator. So this is a, a memorandum of understanding between Tiverton and Little Compton. It's a mirror uh, image of an agreement that the two towns had in 2016 when the situation was reversed, when uh, Little Compton had several vacancies and needed help, and Tiverton firefighters ultimately were able to uh, fill in shifts in, in Little Compton. So I was made aware of it. I got a copy from uh, the fire chief in Little Compton, and we modified it. Uh, Labor Council has taken a good look at it and fine-tuned it. Uh, it essentially uh, allows Tiffin and Fi uh, Little Compton firefighters uh, to be hired to fill shifts that are vacant largely because of vacancies uh, that we have uh, with the approval of the fire chief in um, Little Compton, and we already have uh, approval from both the fire chief and the town administrator in Little Compton, uh, but uh, they work under the direction of the Tiverton uh, fire chief, obviously. The, uh, there's also, again, a highlighted number in here of 36 hours, 24 cents. That's actually the number that was used in the previous agreement several years ago. Um, we're looking to lower that, actually, and um, I talked with the, I've asked uh, the acting fire chief to uh, give me some feedback on that and also talk to the fire chief in uh, Little Compton about it. Um, what I understand is that it would be reasonable to lower that to $31.50, which is essentially the rate that uh, a class one firefighter uh, is being paid here for in overtime. overtime. For overtime. Yeah. overtime. Yeah. 3150. 3150 is what we're proposing right now. And as I understand it, the fire chief and the uh, administrator in Little Compton would be fine with that if you are. Do we, are we comf confident that Little Compton will be able to satisfy our needs in this regard? I think I might be best asking uh, either Bruce or Greg or both to comment on that. <clears throat> there is some interest in Little Compton from some of the uh, Little Compton firefighters, <clears throat> excuse me, to come work some of the shifts. Well, how many? Time will tell, but there is definitely some interest in that, though. Is there any, would it be fruitful to maybe approach? Portsmouth or other neighboring towns to something similar or do we do it would take a little more time probably to you know come up with uh, agreements to the extent that's necessary uh, this could take effect immediately actually. Mm -hmm. so that would be helpful given that we're in a rather pressing uh, situation right now okay okay to me this sounds like exactly the kind of stuff you're supposed to be doing sharing resources mm -hmm. with your neighbors Okay, I just wanted to uh, 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 insert one um, a request for a, for, a, for a little bit of legalese. The, uh, in the purpose section about midway through it references the trust's liability policy. If we could just uh, reference the Rhode Island Interlocal Risk Management Trust uh, using its full official name for those of us who, for those out there who may not be full, so familiar with it. Consider it done. Thank you. Okay. Well, with that, I'll, I'll move. Um, this mem memorandum of understanding uh, to authorize the administrator to move forward with it, including with the possible reconsideration of the hourly rate and the uh, amendment requested by our town solicitor. Second. Okay, we have a live motion and a second. Anybody want to be heard on this? Any further? 
Okay. All those in favor? Okay. A lot of work done here. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for the support. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, sir. Okay, we're moving right along. We're at item uh, 10C. This is the RFP for the town solicitor. I briefly introduced this at the last meeting. And the document that you have is the same document that you had from a couple weeks ago. And uh, what it does is it uh, Amalgamates basically our, our prior our prior version of this. I also looked at three other towns uh, and threw in uh, you know what I understood um, the role also to cover. And so what we're looking for here is is uh, a vote to post this. The target date would be for the um, as you know, Mr. Cisnone is serving in sort of an interim capacity. Good. Um, since uh, about six months ago. And again, by way of review, we actually have quite a few different lawyers that help service the town. We have separate labor council. That was Tim, who, who you just heard for some time. Uh, we have special bond council as needed. We have the school department. The school committee has its own lawyer. Tim, you're off the clock, Tim. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. We're trying. We're trying. Go home. Um, so where was I? We have we have separate lawyers for labor, for bonds, for schools, for municipal police prosecutions. Uh, you just heard something about the trust. Our primary insurance carrier often will assign their own insurance appointed counsel to several of our cases, uh, as, and uh, part of the role of our of our town solicitor, the charter required town solicitor also involves helping coordinate and, uh, and stay, stay as part of that conversation. In fact, um, GEO is also a contributor to even the labor piece that you, that you just heard. Um, the goal here is certainly open to small, large, medium firms, but it's important to identify one lead attorney that will be responsible and accountable for the matter. Obviously, need to be a member of the bar. And um, I won't go through all of the preferences other than to say we recognize that it's very hard to be a subject matter expert, so to speak, in every single area, but in four broad categories, uh, at least as this document would have it, is to looking for candidates that are able to handle a broad array of different topics. A, B, have experience in municipal or state government matters. C, experience in both transactional work and drafting as well as litigation, of both sides of that fence. And finally, counseling uh, representation and advocacy. So, all kinds of specific topical areas. Um, I've also added in there that uh, the best candidates will actually demonstrate some awareness of Tiverton and some of the unique things about Tiverton. Perhaps it's unique land use challenges. The financial town referendum is a very unique thing. I want to focus on that. Also, as we've talked, I see this council developing a legal services utilization policy to add a little more clarity on the service commitments. How, who, you know, how often do we call our legal team? What type of responsiveness should we expect? When do we expect a formal legal head, you know, letterhead opinion versus sort of an off-the-cuff advice? Uh, all that is going to be developed, I, I think, in the next uh, couple months, and we'd certainly love um, this person to be involved in that conversation. This document contemplates a two-year engagement. Of course, all lawyers uh, serve at the pleasure of their clients, so it was really sort of a one-way binding request. And this document comes right out and says what our expected um, budget will be. Of course, we won't know what our actual budget will be until the financial town referendum. And this is not this. The lower bidder still, still will be attractive, um, but it puts that out there. As far as timing goes, I looked for guidance from the council. I think we tentatively talked about, was it the second meeting in May? Yep. Or were we talking about a special meeting? And, and I guess I'd throw, it, I'd let, I'll, I'll throw the open to everybody and also ask, what would you like to see as a deadline? And what would you like to see for potential interviews? I don't know that we, depending on how many applicants we get, that we would interview every single one. So there would probably be a session where we, we narrow it to a, a small pool if we have a lot of applicants. And then 
and then perhaps do some interviews. I'm trying to remember maybe uh, three, four interviews. Any thoughts? I it's one of these you work on for hours. I would, say, yeah. I would say wait, see how many candidates we have, and then decide from there how many we want to interview. What do you think is a deadline as far as getting them back to Nancy? Response deadline? Yeah. What do you What do you normally give Nancy? Like two weeks? Thirty days. Thirty days. A month. So. Okay. So today is the eighth. What are you looking for? A calendar. Let's just see when we're talking May already. One month would be May eighth. So when is our first meeting in May? May 13th. So when is a reasonable amount of time to get that? I, I think you have to give, in this particular position, at least a month. I, I mean, right. so. So that would be, what would that be, May? Six. May, May 13th is the first meeting in May. So if we posted this, say, tomorrow, it would be a little bit of a scramble to get them all in the packets. But about May. Done by the end of this week, then it would still be a month from the May 13th meeting. Yeah, we could call it May 10th, and that way at least by May 13th we'll have some sense of the volume. And okay. Nancy, when does the, I, I know. I know we advertise in some monthly lawyers publication. Lawyers yeah, weekly. I don't know what it is. I'd have when, to contact well, I, well, that's what I'm saying is, you know, if the, I, I don't know when the, Deadline is or when that comes out, but it's a, it's a lawyer's weekly. It's the only only legal publication. In the so, but, it's weekly. but but if the deadline was May tenth, they had to be in by May tenth. You wouldn't be able to get them on the agenda for May thirteenth, or you know, or anything. Well, I get them to the content distribution right. that way, but you're going to have to go through them anyway. Right. You may not want them to reach the point. Right. That's what I'm saying. Depending on how many we get. I, I mean, I'd almost be inclined to go towards the end of May and have June um, to interview candidates and make a choice rather than shorten the response period and maybe not get as many good responses. Well, Memorial Day is May 27th, so the council meeting will be on the 28th. If I may, I, I, you know, from a uh, practitioner's perspective, uh, getting a, res a, a response to a request for proposals in is not particularly difficult. Getting a transition undertaken is very difficult. So I wouldn't push it up to the end of June for a decision. <laughs> um, so anything that you can sort of front end load in terms of timing, I think is better for the town if there is to be a transition. So uh, you know, to do that in a week is. Good point. Tony and I, Tony and I were talking two days ago, three months into my work here. <laughs> so <laughs> the transitions can be tough if, uh, if they're not given enough reason. Try to get it out this week or maybe Friday for You just can't leave. I've got a list of stuff here, but I'll yeah, try to give it a Well, if we could post so it. So we could get it back maybe by May 8th? I think the idea is really we just want to know on May 13th whether we need to schedule a special meeting. I, I don't know that we have to actually make so as long as they're. I know it'll, it might miss the if they came in over the weekend because that's all we need on May 13th is to decide what do we want. See to how do. many we have and how many we're going to interview. Yeah, your, your agenda item would not be for interviews, and you wouldn't have to notice any of the applicants. It would just be right. an agenda item to say review submitted proposals. Right, right. And then schedule. On that meeting, we could either decide to hold a special meeting, or maybe we could come up with some scoring system where everybody submits something. Remember, I'm, also, you're all, I'm also right before the financial calendar. Right? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Would that be? No, that would confuse no? it. Okay. Why don't we just go with me? Okay, just no, at the, off the table. And I will say, I, I it, this one actually changed a lot of the fixed requirements to be more requests or recommendations. So there's not, you know, it doesn't need to be a 20 page or so. Hopefully people can. Mr. President. President. Oh, you have a blank on the, um, on the land use budget. Uh, I didn't know if that was one you filled in. Yeah, I, I, let's do that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not here, so my opinion here, but I, I do believe that um, the balance between land use and general council work is, is uh, you know, swung a little bit from the budget. Uh, you know, as I look at it this year and the expenditures we've taken on in the last three months and looking back at Tony's uh, level of effort on various things, I think given the, the efforts between the planning board and the zoning board and the regular attendance at those meetings, uh, which is a, a valuable, valuable uh, you know, thing for the town to have to avoid future litigation costs on matters like that. Um, I think you know, shifting some, some money out of the general budget and into the land use budget is, is sensible. Not to answer myself, but... Well, I, I think for this document, which is not binding on us, we should go with the budget committee has on the docket, which happens to be what we requested, which was 85 and 30, but I think we are definitely within our rights to to make some shifts. If somebody put a proposal in and said what we can do, the, the general council work 50 that we you know. And for those who's uh, watching, I mean, it's, and, and who knows, maybe it'll go up at the end. So. <laughs> I'll move to post the RFP with a requested response date of May 10th. Second. Second. Any, does the public want to be heard? Any further questions or comments? Anything at all? Okay. Okay. All those in favor? All those in favor? Mr. President, I think there was just a question to clarify. You are putting thirty thousand dollars in the gap for the land sure. use for land yeah. purposes. On the FTR. Yeah. Yeah. Right here. No, 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 no. Here. He left it blank. Paragraph eight. Paragraph eight. I'm sorry. I was looking in the wrong place. I think you have I'll send you one more just and I'll add in the, the item and, and I'll change the deadline to was it Friday? Friday May 10th. Friday, that's a Friday. Okay. Yep. And, and you want the city uh, province journal as well on the Whatever you think is best. Certainly Rhode Island Lawyers Week, I think, is a good, good net. We've been talking about doing this for, for quite a while, so. All right, so uh, we have Councilor De Medeiros, uh on the supporting Councilor Liaison for AFSCME. Does anybody want to speak to that, or should we hold that for another? Um, I spoke with her actually earlier today. She had some items to attend to. She shouldn't make the meeting. Is she, is she all right? Interested? Is she interested? In uh, actually, she she, no. she said she was not at this time. Um, oh. So. Oh, she doesn't want to do it. Yeah. I so, wouldn't hold it then. So what, we can. Why, are we? why don't we stick with the tentative ones we had, unless, and then we yeah. can revisit this one we have with Athens Sal. Okay. Well, it was tentative. No, it's just going to be Justin. Yeah. Did you want to? Does anybody else want to? I think we, we can move on. Unless somebody else wanted to join it, I'll be glad to help if you want. But I don't need to. Okay. The next item, and I'll be very, very brief, is again, I'm trying to, in the spirit of trying to give early indications of things so we can think about them before we just come out and have a big policy debate. But one of the things that I'd love us for to consider is the same way that we've done with our boards and commissions and committees we have very informal liaisons the way we've done with as we were just talking about with labor contracts Nancy was our supporting counselor for police Justin and Donna uh, have done a lot obviously everybody contributes but they've uh, 
done a little bit extra on helping coordinate matters and sort of being there to help help things out. And we have something along the lines of two dozen or so litigation matters. And so one of the things that I'd like to come back and talk about in maybe two weeks, or four weeks, whatever the right time is, is whether we should also <coughs> take that list of two dozen and also spread it around uh, just to have an area that you might um, want to focus on or concentrate on or become a, a little bit of a subject matter expert. I think that can help um, build some knowledge. And sometimes, this, and I, I forgot which case it was, Nancy, but you, we actually had a case where the judge required one of us to send a designee to a mediation. And uh, that was Nancy, Nancy had that one. Oh, was it Mr. McLaughlin's case? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so uh, that would obviously be a, a good a good role for uh, the liaison as well. So anyway, uh, no voting. I just wanted to kind of let you know what I had in mind and uh, more to follow. Okay. Uh, next up is Director Rogers looking for some transfers. Uh, we are taking money from snow removal. I guess it's April 8th, and he's convinced it won't snow again. Um, right now. So we're uh, just taking 23 grand and moving it around to uh, a few other accounts. You want some extended Midwest is going to have a huge storm this weekend. You want to uh, yeah, introduce yes. for Rick Rogers, uh, Tivit and DPW. Uh, thank you, President. And, but we're being cautious. We are leaving some money still in the uh, snow fund. But we would like to make the transfers as listed. I'll move to... Uh, Go ahead. I'll, I'll move to move from snow re removal account 5540-6451 to clerk's pay 5540-5102 for 6000 Overtime, that's 5104 for 9000 Salt, sand, sand, salt, and gravel, 6698 for 6000 Supplies miscellaneous, 7423 for 1000 And dozer repairs, 7645 for 1000 Second. You have a motion to second. Any further discussion, questions? Questions from the public. Okay. All those in favor? Okay. Approved as presented. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have an, uh, another uh, transfer item uh, sponsored by the town administrator. This would be just over $28,000 from our group health retired account. Uh, to basically street lights. Anything further to add? No. Hearing none. May I have a motion? Mr. President, I'll make a motion to transfer twenty-eight thousand four hundred and six dollars and ninety cents from account one hundred twenty-one ninety fifty-two sixty-nine group health retired to account thirty-three eighty sixty-seven forty-five street lights. Okay, may I have a second? Second. Okay, any further discussion? Questions, comments from the public? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor? Okay. So, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, I'm delighted to say that we're about two hours, a little over two hours into this meeting. We've also had an open public forum. But now we're going to come back to the consent agenda items that were pulled off the consent agenda. So. I think we're well on our way of hitting our 10 o'clock, three hour limit. But um, so please keep that in mind as we go back to these consent agenda items. The first one is uh, uh, item B5. So this was way back in the consent agenda 4B5. We were acknowledging receipts and minutes from the planning board. There were three sets, and I, I don't remember who would like to talk about them, but the floor is open. Thank you. Um, I asked that it, it be pulled. Um, I was just um, concerned with on page six of the planning board minutes from uh, February five. It talks about the leisure is leisure leisure leisure. leisure leisure estates under construction, and it would appear that um, there was advice given by the prior town solicitor um, saying that he would this. Uh, whatever his name is, um, Johnson, the owner of the property, would be allowed to put, would have permission to put up a duplex. And, and so he got a permit. It's a R R6 rural residential zone. And now it turns out that he really isn't allowed to do that. 
Um, and I'm just concerned that, um, actually concerned by a statement our now solicitor, at least in the record, made that um, a violation, uh, the second issue was the pending violation on the construction. And I'm, I'm just concerned. Is this a lawsuit we're potentially looking at here? I, I hope not. We're working um, closely with Mr. Johnson to try to um, come to some resolution. Uh, the administrator has uh, been apprised of the situation, and we're working with the uh, keeping the planning board apprised as well. Uh, there was a, a mistake uh, made, and uh, that permit was issued without reference to the overlay district that uh, was applicable to that particular lot. It shouldn't have been allowed, a duplex shouldn't have been allowed because of the overlay. If there was no overlay district, it would be allowed. Um, and so the latest, uh, we reported this to the planning board last week, the latest uh, sense we have from uh, Mr. Johnson is that he will look to have that overlay removed, which uh, is technically is interesting, but we'll get it done. Um, and so therefore, his duplex would then be permitted. Um, and it's my right. understanding now that he's thinking about three duplexes, right? All along, I, I think that was that was um, the plan. He had subdivided into three lots, each of which he thought perhaps would be eligible for a duplex. Um, but what we've agreed is that we, we will, uh, he has a path to get uh, the, the existing construction that he's underway with uh, uh, right by the town by asking for a dimensional variance and, and getting this overlay He does that, then he can continue with his construction. Um, and then he'll have to go back to the planning board or the zoning board or the council, depending on what approach he has, for the remainder of his property and, and get that permitted properly and see what the town uh, is willing and able to do. But that, that will be solved separately. Uh, and again, this is all subject to um, you know, discussions, and, and we're waiting to see what his uh, attorney and, and, and he has now uh, submitted. Okay. Um, and then I guess just to follow up further along, just read, I was just sort of surprised when I read um, the administrative officer and town planner's report for February. I didn't even mention this issue in it, and I was just sort of surprised that it hadn't been mentioned. I, I, I'm, I'm, if I may, on the agenda uh, for the last meeting, that was actually under my purview. So my report included the discussion of the letter of states issue, and, and the AO had a report on other matters, but that was part of the discussion at the meeting. Oh. My, my okay, thank you. I just I just had one thing. The um, also on page six, uh, Mr. Hardy had stated that Mr. Johnson was told that a duplex was allowed uh, by uh, the previous uh, solicitor, and should not have been. He stated that the best solution would be to offer for Mr. Johnson to go to the zoning board. May, may what, I make what a suggestion, Mr. President, I'm, and, and Donna? I don't mean to interrupt, but may I make a suggestion here? Um, I feel really uncomfortable discussing a, an open zoning matter in public right now, where there are multiple unhappy parties. I, it just. Uh, I just don't think that right now it, 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 there are multiple unhappy parties here. Um, and, and I will say in, in, in the report, uh, as I understand it, from what I understand, um, I, I would not necessarily assume that every detail that you're reading in that report accurately represents exactly what happened. So I don't think I would use this as a basis, and I, I just, Jan's nodding. I, I just don't feel like this is a, a well. I, I good disagree discussion because I'm, I'm going on a different different tangent on this. Okay, sorry. Um, my take on this is this isn't the first time that this has happened with with the wrong okay from somebody. I'm just trying to figure out how we stop uh, something going forward when there's an error and then the, uh, someone stating, whoever it might be, that, oh, I got an okay when it never was okay. I mean, how do you stop this sort of thing going on? It's not the first time. It's, it's all can I, can I just make a quick interjection? Unfortunately, these things happen in particular when we have all this turnover in positions. 
we have the prior solicitor getting information from a relatively new planner. Doesn't necessarily include all the details that might make him look into, wait a minute, is there a different zoning, you know, piece of the zoning ordinance. And I, I would, by the way, very much second what uh, Councillor Hilton said. This is probably not a smart thing to discuss in detail, especially when you start using words like errors or, or this or that. I think there are reasons why it happened. I wish it hadn't happened. Uh, we're trying to rectify things as we speak. There are, in fact, multiple unhappy parties, and we're trying to rectify it. The only way we can do it, try to avoid it, is just by being all of us, not one person in particular, but all of us being a little more careful as we deal with these situations. That's really all of this. I guess my only thing, I mean, just <coughs> not that Don is looking for a defense from me, but I mean, it's on the agenda. We're obviously we're not approving these reports, but somebody's asked us to acknowledge we've received them. And so it seems entirely appropriate. If I may, Mr. President, I, the reason those are in the minutes is because I, I felt it necessary to have that discussion in public with the planning board, which we did last week, because at some point they're going to be asked to make a decision on a very complicated set of facts. And given the Open Meetings Act requirements, we can't go have individual conversations with them to try to explain the background. We have to do that in a public forum. And, and it, it, it may come to this council as well at some point, uh, depending on what the applicant's choice is. So I, I personally am not uncomfortable. Uh, the facts are the facts. Um, and, and uh, you know, of course, we have to be sensitive to how we discuss them. And we don't want to uh, represent that, that we know what's in a report to be factually true. We don't know right. that. Right. Um, and, and if we ever got to litigation, how could God help us? I hope we don't. Um, uh, you know, that might be an issue. But I think right now we're on a good path to up with the best of all worst possible solutions here, and I think having an open discussion about it um, will, will help you if, if you have to make some decision not as to a, a, a zoning or, a, or a, an appeal on something or whatever it might be. And I, yeah. I, I understand the reticence. I understand that this is not always a great way to do this, but we're not in a great position with this uh, particular application, and I think we have to be as open as possible. Um, and, I, and I would also add, I think, you know, I just want to reinforce what Jan said initially, which I agree with 100%, and to, to Councillor Cook's question directly. Um, the only way you can avoid these types of things is to have uh, long-term staff with institutional knowledge who understands your code after years and years of experience with it. Um, when you don't have that, you will have these types of errors. And so whatever that means for the council, I don't know necessarily, but I think that is the only solution you'll ever have. Um, you, you can hire five lawyers to look at every application. If the question is asked wrong, they'll all get the same wrong answer. Potentially. Yeah, I guess. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that with the consent agenda, and we we have um, these minutes and various reports that um, we should be able to take one out and ask because we are the town council and we have to answer for. Usually, it usually comes right at our doorstep, you know, when there's a problem. So I just wanted to discuss it because I didn't understand how it happened. Thank you. So I think the, the we're just acknowledging receipts. So I'm just going to suggest, as is all consent agenda items, if somebody wants to sponsor to bring this back on a future agenda for extended discussion, and maybe that should be in closed session. I'm free to do that. If we think there's actually a factual error in the report, um, I still think we would still acknowledge receipt of it, but then if somebody wants to challenge the report, I guess we could think about that. I don't mean this, I'm not trying to stifle debate. I just want to, this is a consent agenda item. So do we, do we want to set this for further discussion on a regular session, or do I want to leave that open to, to all of you if you want to put in for that? Um, I'm hoping that um, just to see on could update us on it on a on a basis or or our town administrator uh, I guess we'll eventually know what the outcome is that's a, I guess that's the best we can I can't do. wait either so no I think you should work 24 hours seven days yeah thank you <laughs> I'm happy to take that off, off uh, uh, what I the rights with shoulders but I, I'm sure we'll be discussing this with the planning board and others and, and your staff in the next month or two uh, okay and, 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 and receipt is not an endorsement. It's like a Facebook like. It's not an endorsement, right? You <laughs> receive the report. Uh, you don't have to correct factual errors. Uh, that's, that's up to the reporting body. Okay. 
I'm not on Facebook, so right, I don't so know what I'm missing. That was B5 <laughs> and C1, is that correct? B5 and C1, and then, uh, of course, if you want to bring okay. this back for further discussion, just let us know. Okay. So Who's should we move to C2? C2, I, is that a separate no, issue? No, no it's issue. just part of it. Oh, okay. That, okay. No. So I'll move the rest of the consent agenda. Second. Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, all those in favor? Okay. Make sure the eagle eyes, and again, don't hesitate to bring it back. And you can always talk as long as you're not formal. Okay. Okay, that brings us to Sorry, right, someone rewrote the agenda. Okay. okay, so we have three uh, we have three specific items from the town administrator, and then for general announcements, we put them all together. So let's do the three specific items over to Mr. Administrator. Thank you. I'll try to be quick on the fire rescue purchase. We were able to get the um, request or invitation to bids out. Um, and we're hoping to um, get responses sometime soon. I think there is interest. Uh, we're also cautiously optimistic that uh, the party that has the demonstration model uh, is going to try to hang on to it for us uh, as long as possible. So hopefully this will all work out in the end. Um, unless there are questions about that one, I'll move to the... Uh, I have a question. Yes. Um, is there an update on the 2012, the status of the 2012? I Not yet. It's being looked over um, at, I forget the name of it, in Fall River. Um, and we had decided that if, in fact, the uh, repair uh, is possible and in the range of $8,000, $9,000 like that, that under the circumstances, it actually does make sense to invest that money uh, in that particular uh, vehicle rather than thinking that we're going to buy another demonstration uh, model. Uh, but we have to hear back still. I don't think Bruce is here. No, that's okay, I think. Uh, we just need to hear back, uh, you know, what the, what the ultimate um, findings are of, of this uh, dealership or whatever it is. So bids are out for the three, uh, for the rescue to replace it? Do we have I'm sorry, I can't. The bids are out for the rescue. Yes. When do we expect responses? I forget exactly what the date was. Um, I think we only had like two weeks or so for it. So, it be so before our next meeting? Or before our next meeting? I believe so, yeah. So on the uh, marine outboards, uh, we have received the bids, and we have actually a a low bid that we uh, that I would ask approval to award uh, the contract to from PK Marine Service in the amount of thirty-eight thousand five hundred and ninety-nine dollars and ninety cents. And what? And and that's coming out of the capital reserve. Capital reserve fund. And and applying whatever we currently have in the. Uh, the maintenance, the, the harbor masters. Uh, oh, the 11, sub, was it 11 something? 11 yeah, there's yeah. there's money in oh. there. So. What was that amount again? I'm sorry. 38,599. Right? Okay. Are you looking for a vote on that? Yeah, I, I guess. And just so. Uh, just oh, so yeah, you know I think you already voted to. Let us do it. Yeah, and we, so we, you know, I. You know, who knows? We, we tried to uh, sort of reformat the agenda to add a little more clarity. And one of the things we add is a specific note that says that we could vote on any item unless it's denominated as for discussion only. So uh, are you comfortable with the vote on this, uh, given the agenda we have? Any down? Any? Well, any? <coughs> the administrator is saying we already voted. Yeah, on I think you previously yeah, actually proved to go I'm for it. We vote on it. We, we, we are comfortable with the vote that you already took. Okay. So we're good to go. Sorry. You don't need another. Yep. Double vote. All right, then we're good. So lastly, on sorry, the... Is there any objection to that? Everybody, everybody good? Okay. Thanks. On the consulting engineering services, I unfortunately do not yet have a recommendation. Um, the complications there have been that this has to be done under what is called uh, qualification-based selection requirements, which is different from how you typically uh, receive bids and compare them. You can only look at qualifications and not look and not even ask for um, 
the numbers until you have decided who is the most qualified and then you enter into negotiations with them. Hmm. Um, it really is very difficult to do, especially when you have two applications that are equally qualified. <laughs> so I'm currently waiting for a, a second set of uh, fees because I ultimately do have to compare fees and, and uh, I hope to have that within days. In the meantime, uh, we have taken steps to make sure that Steer Engineering uh, is still attending uh, the meetings that we, we need them at. So that has been uh, happening. I hope that the next time they have to attend the meeting, uh, we'll actually have a contract in place uh, either with them because they're one of the applicants or with the other person. Can I ask a question? It, it, are, the last time that we did this, um, the applicants also were available for a meeting with the planning board members um, because they have to work with them on a day in day out basis is that part of the plan with the interview process is that that they'll also have an opportunity to interview with the planning board I wasn't planning on that uh, partly because you know, there's so much I, I I wasn't told that that was the the process but we, we can do that if you want I mean, it's I just going to take longer I, well I I don't want it to take a whole lot longer but on the plan on the other hand the planning board knows specifically what are the engineering areas that they and that's a lot what their questions were they asked a lot about the particular things that they see that are most difficult for them because they're the ones who see it all the time and that helped evaluate you know choosing the the best candidate who had the most experienced. I, I have to say that, you know, frankly, I think I know a fair amount about this as well. I think that the both applicants I happen to know are very experienced in doing this kind of work and are known to uh, the town, including planning board people. And I honestly don't believe uh, it's necessary to, you okay. know, add an extra layer to this. I, I just tried to get that in place sooner rather than later. Any comments, questions from our planning board chair, or is everybody in have, the right direction? I, I have one. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Sorry. I no, no, no. Well, I'll let Susan go. I, I had, as John moved quickly off the fire department thing, I had one more thing about the rescue truck, but I'll let Susan okay, well, let's, go. Yeah, let's, um, Susan Gill. Okay. Susan Gill, planning board. Hi. Uh, I guess my concerns are because if we have an engineer available at the meetings. The other things that I know, like the administrative officer needs to have ongoing discussions with them during the month to make arrangements, to pick up plans. There also need to be review of plans. Um, we do set up the escrow accounts for the engineering services that is paid for by the applicant, but I don't know if the way it's currently set up, if it's only that um, he's instructed to attend the meeting. I just feel like we're really kind of floundering here. I mean, we have two very large solar developments. We have um, Mr. Johnson's application coming up. We have environmental review statements um, and a couple other small minor subdivisions on our next month's agendas. I think we're going to have to have two meetings and we just feel like we need to have professional um, backups, you know, to help us answer questions at the meetings and ongoing during the month. So that's why I am. Um, Felt it was important to bring it to your attention. You're the chain of command for for the planning board. I and, don't know if anybody has actually said that they would only attend meetings. They are available to continue the work that they have been doing until we have something in place. That's the understanding. Okay, that hadn't been conveyed to to well, me. So I don't make that, assumptions. That, no, but that was that wasn't what was conveyed to me. And I did speak to the administrator in February and March about the interviews, interview process, and I just hadn't been getting any feedback. So, um, and when I spoke to Steer last Thursday, they had not heard from um, that they're, any they're setup. Not just staffing the meetings, but also supporting. Right, the probably, yeah, pro they have to provide support because we need to have uh, be able to ask questions um, to critique at at our meetings as well. And, it's just very important. Otherwise, we're we're working at a real disadvantage. Do you have, a, do you have a, a, an account manager, like a relationship manager, a primary point of contact with the firm? Um, well, yes, yes, and yes. Steve Baker and also. Joe Cardell are okay. the people that we work with. Okay. Okay. So yeah. And I, and I appreciate reaching out to all of us. Just let us know. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay, uh, back to fire. So two things on the fire department. Um, 
and and I know that I suggested this the last time I didn't really get any place but I would like to point out that in my curiosity about purchasing things um, there is a provision under Rhode Island purchasing where you can purchase things without bids uh, in an emergency and the failure of a critical piece of equipment qualifies so if we needed to, um, we could purchase the rescue as an emergency. Um, given though that we have bids coming in soon, it sounds like, my next question would be for the solicitor because, um, and for the treasurer. And I say this because I know that President Coulter had a thought about waiting for the FTR. I would ask the treasurer whether or not you can purchase something now or how you purchase something now and have the auditors approve that if you're not paying for it to the following fiscal year? Um, or do we have to find a, another workaround to that? I only say that I know that in the past there have been some issues about things that are or, you know, arrive at the end of one fiscal year and whether or not you can build them later or do you do a borrowing thing. I guess what I'm saying is as soon as we can get this fire truck, if we have bids, I don't want to lose another two weeks of then how do we sort out the payment process for this because we're not entirely sure. So could we start, I mean, could we start on that now so we're, have a definitive answer as soon as the bids come back? And just for quick clarity, my proposal is actually that we don't wait for the FTR. My proposal is we wait until the petition deadline, which is, I think, less than two weeks now. Yeah. It's Saturday, April 18th at noon. And I would even support a vote now <laughs> if, that, if that were the case, it would be authorized. I, I want to focus back on your question, but just for clarity, I'm not supposing it's Suggesting we wait all the way till the FTR, which is May 20th? 18th. May 18th. I think we could actually go a whole month earlier. Well, I'll move to uh, to authorize the ordering of a, a vehicle upon confirmation that all of the proposed budgets have included funding for it, with the expectation that money from the general fund can be used to advance the purchase if necessary to be replenished by money provided through the FTR. I think uh, that, that would probably satisfy the, the issues I would have about spending money that's not yours to spend yet. Uh, the way you phrase that, I don't think you can do that tonight because it's not posted for anybody's agenda by the next meeting. Um, or, or as, well, the, uh, the agenda does say we can vote on anything that's on the agenda. Well, I, I, first of all, I <laughs> first of all, I, I would suggest that we definitely check with the town treasurer because there are accounting rules about you know how you can do those things, um, and the other thing is, you know, Councillor Katz and I have a disagreement. I do not believe under state law, not the charter, under state law, that we can simply in and of ourselves vote to take money out of the general fund that has not been appropriated as part of our annual appropriation by the people. I don't believe that the state law allows us to do that. So again, I go back to my between now and when we can, we get a bid in for this, we have a real plan of how we can pay for this and not end up with another month of trying to figure out how we do it. I, I, think, I think that's fair, and I think that, that um, in, in the end, the response to the RFPs and what sort of contract is, is, is put forth by the bidders will, will dictate that. Uh, it may be that, that you know, different options have different timing built into it. I don't know. Um, you know, I don't know. Uh, Does anybody? But I think the treasurer probably would have a, a you know, good input on yeah. that, and, and some of it is dependent on the formal contract that comes before you. And just as a matter of procedure, there is a live motion. Will there be a second to that motion? Second. Could, could you repeat the motion? Um, it's to authorize the, the purchase of the vehicle upon confirmation that all of the budgets put forward for the FTR include funding and the expectation that 
if necessary for the purchase to go forward, the general, general funds can be used in expectation that they'll be uh, replenished in the new fiscal year per the vote of the FTR. I'll second it. Okay, and I just wanted to comment. I, I, to me, I'm, I mean, I'm delighted to have the treasurer chime in, but I, I actually care a lot less about what the accounting rules are than what the law is. So it's not just accounting rules. I don't really she care what the, the accounting rules are. Right? So, um, and so I guess we're going to need to put you on the spot to make sure that, you know, we're not on legal thin ice, even if it requires a footnote to the financial statements. If it's okay, I, I will reach out to the treasurer and, and maybe Jan and I can get ourselves comfortable with, with whatever you might need to, to pay for that up for the auditor's sake. I think it, it does come down to um, just making sure that you've, you've crossed your T's and dotted your I's on your financials. Um, you know, you, you, uh, from a legal, legal, legal perspective, it's just this balance between binding a future legislature or binding you know, uh, money before there's a vote to spend that money. Um, you, 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 have, you don't have the authority to do that, but you're ratifying a three-year fire department contract tonight as well, which effectively does the same thing. So uh, you know, you're, you're, it's not going to stop, let's put it that way. If I was the, if I was the, the bidder, would I be concerned, uh, maybe? But I don't think that they have any fear um, that you're not going to buy the truck, especially if they deposit down the house. That's the value of it. So. I'd be interested to know what provision of state law tells us we can't spend money out of our general fund. It, well, I, the, the state law basically says that you can't spend without a process beyond what was appropriated for you by the year. The voters have not appropriated for us to take any money out of that general fund other than what they voted for as part of the FTR last year. And there is a, there is a process that involves an excess fund, but the, the council can't just vote to do it. You have to have, if, and I, if I read this correctly, this has to be, it, it's like a special appropriation. So it requires a special meeting. It requires all this special posting. It's not simply like the council can help themselves to the, to the general fund. Council, just, just so I understand, you're, you're talking about sort of the balanced budget provisions of the state law to say that you, you have to, you can only spend what you take in. N no, it's not that. It's it's in the it's in the appropriation section, and it's basically that that whatever the voters, whatever the people, whether you have an FTM or an FTR, whatever you have, whatever the voters say to you, this is your appropriation for the year. That's what you can spend, and you can't spend beyond that appropriation without going through this other special process that you have to get permission from you it's not the yeah, it's the the excess in the reserve isn't a isn't a slush fund or a contingency fund that the council can just dip into whenever they feel like it 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 wasn't a it wasn't part of our annual appropriation the, the reason why i think that analysis is correct is because the charter itself is the equivalent of a state statute and as a special act it's going to override any of that other general stuff and so if the charter allows us to declare an emergency which i think you would agree it it may well be, well, then we should be okay. But this whole discussion is very interesting, but isn't this almost certainly likely to be totally academic because in 10 days we're going to know for sure that every single budget proposal is going to fund the fire truck just like we did and the budget committee did? Well, I think, I think the question, Mr. President, becomes yeah. when do you have to write the check to pay for the truck? That's the question. If you want to write that check before July 1, I think Councilor Hilton has But a, that's not just the suggestion isn't one. to write the check. The suggestion is to enter in a binding contract that the check will be written. Which is why July I suggested that, that it may be moved when we see the contract will end. Is that right? So we're all I, good. We're, we're all good. I, I am all I. I would like to get a new ambulance as soon as humanly possible, and I just don't want another meeting where we get the bids to come in, okay, this is good, now we spend two more meetings researching how we come up with the funds to pay for it, therefore that's why I'm asking if the solicitor could talk to the treasurer now. Right. And, and so when they come in, we have a plan for how we can do this that's legal. And it's not just the accounting thing. It's the law that the treasurer has to follow, too. I mean, she's got. All right, well, absolutely have to do that. I'd put forward that the, uh, the, mo the motion I made will make the process go forward automatically. And if 
the solicitor or the treasurer discovers something that ought to prevent it, we will convene an emergency meeting to prevent the purchase of the rescue. But if we don't convene that meeting, it will happen. I mean, that's what the motion would do. Well, I don't think we need a motion. I mean, it's going to have to come in front of us at our meeting. We can't. Not by this motion. No, we, we have to award a bid. We, 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 it's at the next meeting, the bids will come to us, right? Only the council can award a bid, so it's got to come in front of us anyway at the next meeting. Well, then I just included my motion that the administrator can effectuate the choice of the purchase. I think you're, mo I'm sorry, wait, your motion. I, I really don't understand what we're having. I, not, I really, <laughs> how do we make this any more clear? This town council, all seven of us, including the one that's not here, wants to buy this fire truck as soon as absolutely possible. We've got to comply with the bidding law. We're trying to respect the voters at the FTR. We're all on the same page on this. What are we talking about here? Trisha raises a good point. Please do every possible piece of diligence you can with the treasurer to make sure that we're not subject to some kind of attack. You have to write the check on July 1st or tomorrow, then great. We want to take a second vote, we'll take a second vote, but why don't we do it tonight so that we cannot have any more ambiguity on this question that this town council wants a fire truck as soon as you can find them. Do we have a motion? A motion and a second. There we go. Another fire truck. Fire, fire rescue. Fire yeah, sorry, I didn't mean fire. a ladder. Truck. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm getting all fire. I'm trying to get us out of the ground. I got confused. All right, good, good stuff. Good stuff. We need a vote, right? Okay, good stuff. No, no, I'm good. We, we want to be squeaky queen, clean. Someone will complain. All right, all those in favor? Is anybody opposed? Are there any abstentions? I'm abstaining only because I don't agree with the idea that we can simply take money out of the general fund without a process that they the town solicitor identifies. Well, I, I don't know, Trisha. It says right in the chat that we can do it. I, I'm just, I, I'm entitled to abstain. Thank you, I did. Okay. I, uh, I will, I, uh, all right. I find it unlikely that there's going to be a budget that does not fund this fire, but we'll find out. Okay, general announcements. Mr. Administrator, have you forfeited your... Yeah. Okay. Um, town clerk. We're grouping the general announcements together. Anything generally? You good? Jan, you good? Okay. Town solicitor? I only have seven or eight items. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have eight minutes. <laughs> no, none. Okay, and then um, I just actually, in all seriousness, just not, I think on that... I'd like to extend our condolences to the fire chief. His father passed away. Um, police chief. Police chief. I'm, I'm sorry. I it's okay. really smoked today. We're yeah. on the fire department. That's why the you... police chief. I very much apologize. Um, yes. The services are uh, Friday. We have a Friday four is the four to seven. Yep. Yes. Yes. Four to seven. Okay. Any other comments or uh, questions? Just for clarity for the public, I wanted to point out that we did have the open public forum today at this meeting. We also had somebody who signed up to appear on the agenda. So both of those are, are possible. When we don't have an executive session, when we do have an executive session, uh, just the first one will be available where you request. But we had it today, and nobody wanted to discuss anything that wasn't on the agenda. And that is always available to residents of the town to speak on things that are on the agenda. No executive session. It is motion possible. to adjourn. We have a motion to adjourn. Will there be a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor? All right. Good night, everybody.